general um, population numbers, these numbers have changed. Generally speaking, in the world, we have a little bit more than what's listed here. In the United States, numbers sometimes can be about as high as 320 uh, million people. And then you've got your different scales of analysis showing there. Um, uh, that sure would be terrible if he called me right now, wouldn't it, though? Um, okay, so and that would be my luck, too. Uh, how would you define overpopulation? Um, we're, we're gonna, well, overpopulation is, is when we think about um, a, an area having not enough land, or I guess not enough resources to support the uh, population that exists within that region. Uh, an area's population exceeds the capacity of the environment to support an example at, at an acceptable standard of living. Uh, this here is where we consider overpopulation. We, we have Malthusian theory and all that that plays in directly to that, but I wanted y'all for now to know what a definition of that would be. Okay, I'm not worried about the video here. Um, I wanted to show you this map that um, demonstrates, when we're looking at development, this is pretty consistent with all the different indicators that we saw with that. And that is in places like the United States and Europe and most of the area of north of what is known as the Brant Line, which would be uh, basically you know, this region here. Everything north of that, usually the food percentage is pretty good, the starvation is pretty low or non-existent. And places like Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge amount of, uh, of starvation due to simply, simply due to poverty and lack of access to resources, lack of access to better jobs, lack of access to health care, and all these different things that we discussed when we looked at this stuff in Chapter 10 Development. Um, and it's directly related to to population. So none of this stuff is really isolated to any one unit. You're gonna see a lot of overlap, especially after having now done development a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, we'll, we'll skip that guy for now. Um, uh, uh, not worried about the debate questions right now. All right, so when we look at population, one of the important things you wanna do is associate four main regions with their population trends and population tendencies, and that is, East and Southeast Asia, or South and East, East and South Asia, Southeast Asia and Europe, uh, as the as the single areas in the world where the majority of people live. In fact, you guys have all seen. If I would have thought about it in, in advance, I would have put it in this PowerPoint. Well, there is a map that shows everyone, every within the bubbled area. It consists of about half of or 50 percent of the of the population in the world. And, and I don't have that up here, but that bubbled area would consist of South Asia, I'm sorry, of Southeast Asia and, and East Asia. Now, South Asia being associated mostly with India and Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan. Uh, and these, these regions here where we know about a billion people or just over a billion people live in India alone. Uh, these are areas that um, inhabit, I guess, consist of most of the world's inhabitants. Um, all right, moving on, moving on, moving on. Here is what they look like in a cartogram. All right, we remember what a cartogram is, right? It's gonna be a map that shows um, the size of the country in relation to the size of a phenomenon. In this case, population. So we're not looking so much at uh, uh, accuracy here or a projection we could use to navigate or whatever it might be. It is a thematic map that's designed to, in this case, like I said, show the extent of how many people live in a certain area. And India and China are ginormous because they are going to be regions where, um, where they have the most population. A billion, you know, about three billion people roughly between the two of them. Bangladesh is tiny in real life, but in this map, Bangladesh and Pakistan both are pretty big because of a lot of people. The United States is the third most populous country in the world, um, but has about one third roughly the people of India. And, and so we, we know that there's a lot of uneven distribution of population. And that really is what we're looking at here with this cartogram. That's also what we're looking at when we look at maps like this to show the population densities of the world. This, this map has a uh, weird color scheme, but it's showing persons per square kilometer based on the different color. Um, the, the redder the colors are, the more people are gonna be in there. Um, and it's showing population density, which is the frequency in which you're gonna see uh, uh, more and more people over, over space. The frequency in which something is gonna occur is its density, okay? Population density. Some of the most sparsely populated areas is this area here, 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 all right? 
I'll, I'll just to make sense out of what I just discussed, in case I use the screencast, these regions here, tell me about them. What's, what's characteristic of these particular areas I circled? Why are people living there? I said there's, there's no ocean access, so maybe that's part of it. But you do have coastal regions around here. Okay, over here. It's, it's too cold. Where's my pen? Over here. Too cold. Why about this? Mountains. Too... I don't want to look like an illiterate. Over here. Too uh, high. Um, too cold. Completely inhospitable. Why about this one right here? Desert. Or too hot. All right, y'all see the trends here? Um, once again, too cold, too uh, cold, too dry, too, too arid, not enough people living in these areas. The Amazon. Okay, so these are areas where the, 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 the world itself is not suitable for human settlement. And, and the word for that is probably in the PowerPoint pretty soon. The word for that that I want you to know is the ecumen. Areas that are good for human settlement. Okay, so areas that are not ecumen would be examples like Sahara Desert or the Amazon River Basin or um, you know this the Alberta uh, province of Canada. Any of those would be really good examples of that. Um, here's a little bit more information. This right here is what I was just now talking about that I highlighted on the, the previous slide. Areas that are too dry, too wet, too cold, too high are generally going to be places that are not part of this ecumen. In other words, places where people are not going to want to stay. So people like to follow the path of least resistance. In your book, there is, oh here it is right here, great. The PowerPoint is all ready to go. You can see that the ecumen region has consistently grown throughout time to the point that now we are able to uh, live in some uh, form or fashion in a lot of the world space, we still only occupy a minuscule amount of the world space in terms of human settlement. Most people like to live in uh, coastal regions, right? And coastal regions is where most people like to live. Uh, so Africa is like an exception with the growing population, but the African population in general is not as high in terms of its density as some of these other regions. But people tend to, like I said, uh, in Brazil, uh, people like to live along waterways. So I think, I can't remember the statistic, but like some unbelievable uh, large number of people in general on average live near the coast. Okay. Um, We've got different ways of measuring population density. One of those ways is arithmetic density, which is just simply the mathematical definition. It's population. We're looking at people. The total number of objects in an area or, or people in an area is what the arithmetic population density is going to be. Sometimes you will see this number as simply population density. All right. Physiological density is going to be the number of people supported by a unit area of arable land. What do we mean by arable land? It's another word. I don't even know if this is a word, but it means farmable. In other words, a place where you can have farmland or support agriculture is going to be arable land. So this is what physiologic density is. And it's super important we understand that distinction because physiological, it, it, sometimes the numbers here can be really, really high when the numbers here are not so high. Uh, it has to do with how you're trying to characterize population density or distribution. Agricultural density is very similar to physiologic, except instead of looking at people per unit of arable land, you're looking specifically at the number of farmers to, uh, uh, to the amount of arable land. All right, so once again, if this number is, is ridiculously uh, uh, high, so you might have three or four farmers per every, I don't know, 1,000 kilometers of arable land, then it could be that you're in an MDC where a lot of the work is automated. They might have uh, large farms that produce a lot of, a lot of um, food for people to, to sustain themselves, but you don't need a whole lot of farmers. 
if the number is really relatively high where you have a lot of farmers per the amount of arable land, then you may be in an LGC where most people are, are contributing to the world's number one um, economic activity, and that is subsistence agriculture. Okay? <clears throat> Moving on. This map right here shows persons per square kilometer. What kind of density is that based on what we just now looked at? We got arithmetic density. I'll write that up. Because it's simply people divided by the land area. People in the country divided by the land area. Um, now this one here is showing persons per uh, square kilometer of arable land. So which one is this one going to be? Physiological. Okay, and notice that some of the colors like India and China are, are going to look a little bit different now, right? India and China have a lot more people per square kilometer. Uh, by the way, China's population density is relatively low compared to its overall population. Anybody know why that is? The um, so line, like that right there, <clears throat> the vast majority of the people in China are going to live over here. All right. And this region here is mostly like you got the plateau, the Tibetan plateau and the Gobi Desert and all these areas where people tend to not live. And in this region here, they're mostly doing subsistence farming. All right. So finally, we've got farmers per square kilometer of arable land. And what we're looking at in this case is your um, agricultural, agricultural density. So a lot of vocab associated with this particular section um, that would really help us, I mean, and we have enough insight at this point, um, you, you have enough connection to the human driver content to really be able to apply these definitions. And it probably makes more sense to you at this point of the course than maybe it did the, in the very beginning. All right, so um, this right here, this slide shows a comparison of some of the different regions on the basis of their arithmetic physiologic and agricultural density. I'm only going to take the time to show you a few examples here. The first one being the United States. All right. Notice the percent of farmers in the workforce is 2% of the workforce, very, very small amount. The percent of arable land, relatively low. All right. But um, it's an MDC, and we're not really doing without. Our population density is relatively low because the West is very, very sparsely populated, and our most densely populated area is the New England region. Egypt here, which I'll use a different color for that. Actually, I'll just erase this to make it neater, and then use a different color. Uh, Egypt is going to be in a weird situation where their arithmetic population density is relatively low, but because they only have people living along the Nile River, all right, the physiologic density, in other words, the amount of people per unit of farmland is extremely, extremely, um, there's a, a very few people per, uh, I'm sorry, it's very high, very, a ton of people per unit of arable land. The land has to go further for feeding their populations or more likely they're probably um, importing tons of food. Probably importing tons of food. Agricultural density, 251 farmers per unit of arable land. I'll move on past that. Okay. Um, quick review. We're, heck, we're going to do it. The most rapidly growing population is, is occurring in where? Anybody know? LDC. LDC. Specifically, we're going to say Africa, um, and we're going to say Sub-Saharan. All right. Um, another place where you still see a little bit of growth is in um, South Asia, but overwhelmingly, the majority of the of the next generation of, of global population is going to occur in Africa. The most populous country in the world is China. China. All right. Second most populous is India. Third most populous is the United States. A country with a large amount of arable land and a small number of farmers will likely have a um, what kind of agricultural density? Let's see, we're looking at a large amount of arable land and a small amount of farmers. We have a uh, it's going to be a, hang on, large amount of arable land and a small amount of farmers will have a lower agricultural density. Um, no, uh, 75% of the world's population lives on 5% of the earth's surface. That's the statistic I was trying to remember the other day. The portion where humans live is also called, what's it called, y'all? 
There we go. So a good little formative assessment, checking for understanding. And cumin. I want to make sure I spell it right. Okay, moving on. Components of population growth, you've got crude birth rate, crude death rate, and natural increase. The birth rate is how many live births per 1,000 people. Death rate, how many deaths per 1,000 people. I almost said live deaths per 1,000. Natural increase is when you subtract the two from one another, and the number left over either is going to determine that the population is rising or that the population is going down, depending on how those numbers balance out. So what you're going to do is, computation-wise, subtract the birth rate from the death rate. If you get a negative number, what does that mean? Population is it's going down. Okay. Now, why in the world, uh, uh, in this case, n per, um, per 100, okay? So what you do is you get the number here and you divide by 100. You do that because usually this rate is expressed in a percentage. So sometimes you will see um, CBR um, minus CDR uh, uh, divided by all this, all this divided by 100 so that you'll get a decimal and, and the, you know, the decimal is because you're, you're trying to measure this in a form of a percent. Um, I think on my test, I actually asked you all a question that required you to do this. I don't see them putting something like that on the AP exam because they're not going to want you like, to use a calculator unless they just give you a really easy example. But that's what that's looking at. Um, crude birth rate, number of, uh, so we just looked at that. Um, all right, so life expectancy is another demographic uh, uh, indicator that we need to be familiar with. We already discussed that life expectancy actually factors in quite nicely to human development, right? It's one of the, the it's a, it's a health-related indicator to human development is how long people are living. Um, places with the lowest life expectancy is going to be sub-Saharan Africa. Places with the highest um, life expectancies is going to be, use a different color for that, it's going to be your um, European, your North American, your Japanese and South Korean uh, locations. And even places, once again, that are north of the Brandt line that we had talked about earlier. Like um, Eastern Europe and Russia, their life expectancies aren't as good as the MDCs, but they're definitely not super bad. I would say that's, that's pretty old for an average age. The, remember, there's a lot of factors to play into life expectancy. And life expectancy is the average number of years, not the standard. So you can imagine that people are going to live to be older than 74 in Russia. If you look at places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which has 44% life expectancy, does that mean people only live to be 44? Do they have no old people here? They have a lot of old people here. So why is the life expectancy so low in, MDC, in LDCs? Anybody remember? They don't have as much, but they have increasingly more and more access to medicine. But those who are the most vulnerable to things like malaria and sicknesses and diseases are what kind of people? Well, old people and also who else? Young people. Remember we talked about child mortality rates. Child mortality rates. The lower the child, or I guess the higher the child mortality. Mortality means death. All right. The higher the child mortality, the lower the life expectancy because those young lives that are dying at like five years old or younger is factored into the overall average life expectancy. So if you make it past five or you know 15 or 20 years old, yeah, you, you still have a lot of deaths, but a lot of those guys are increasingly living longer and longer and longer as this becomes a more developed region. All right, it's the kids that bring down the life expectancy. Um, this one here is a, is a chart that shows natural increase. Um, uh, 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 so I'm not really sure of the context there. We're going to skip that one for now. Oh, here we go. That makes sense. Natural increase rates, percentage by which a uh, population grows in a year. Uh, which is what we had just now talked about is going to be the, the crude birth minus the crude death rates. Um, it's the, the, the global natural increase rate is starting to kind of uh, go down is the trend because of what we're going to call what we call demographic momentum. You can still see where more and more people are being added to the global population. But we're talking a minute about the, about the demographic transition model 
which is going to help us to re remember and understand and have a little bit more clarity about what demographic momentum is and how population and natural increase changes at a more regional scale. Um, this chart, uh, I think I even gave y'all maybe an, uh, uh, FR, an FRQ with this chart on it, or, or um, we've looked at it a few times. Uh, what it is is it shows that global population uh, going back as far as 8,000 BC, as long as human beings have really been on the earth, uh, the ice age will have happened around 10,000 BC. So this is like, we're looking at the, the origin of agriculture here. All right, we're looking at the origin of agriculture that far back. And really population didn't change that much. It didn't go up really high. I mean, it went up some, uh, you know, it went up some, but it didn't really start to, to skyrocket until you've got about the, the Renaissance here. Population starts to go up a little bit. Urbanization starts to occur in places like Europe. And in China and India, they had already gone through their golden age and population rose. But right about here, you've got um, the 1750s. And this one here is when you've got industrial, industrial revolution. Starting in which country? England. All right, so England, uh, Great Britain. Uh, we're going to say uh, Great Britain, mainly due to first the uh, the second agricultural revolution. The enclosure movement enabled people to create more food with less work, and also freed up a bunch of workers to go into factories that enabled them to have more goods. You have more food, you have more goods. Now people are going to start to develop science that's centered on making lives live longer. And this is kind of the start of our um, increasing, our, I guess our, our exponential population growth, as you saw on the previous slide. About 82 million people are added to the world annually. I guess that's for today. Um, that's pretty intense. Here are some more statistics. I'm not too worried about looking at that right now because I want to get through the, the, the basics. Natural increase, the majority of that is going to be in Sub-Saharan Africa where they have less access to contraceptives and they have less access to education about how babies are born, believe it or not. Um, infant mortality rate, we just talked about the child mortality rate. Infant mortality rate is when kids die between the ages of, one, or of zero and one years old. That's very, very sad. That's the infant mortality rate. The child mortality rate, which I'm guessing is going to be on the next page, or I'll write it up here anyway, is going to be child mortality rate. Child mortality rate is going to be from one to five. That's what we're considering a child. Sometimes you'll hear these words used interchangeably, but infant refers only to like baby babies, like actual infants. Um, what this does is it shows you crude birth rate per thousand. Uh, what region on earth is having the most babies? Oh, fancy that! Because they can't take care of them. That's why we have the most growth going on. It has nothing to do with their choice. It's just they simply are uneducated and don't know. The number one way that you can make population start to go down, and not population go down, but make birth rates go down, and level out is to educate them. Uh, uh, giving them access to things like contraceptives may not be accepted by their societies. Um, some of the traditions in some of these regions in here are to have as many kids as possible to help out with farm work. Um, women or girls are not expected to go off to, and, and go to school and things like this. So you want to educate women and you want to educate people in general. This is how you're going to stop this trend and make these numbers look a little bit better in places like um, Sub-Saharan Africa. The total fertility rate is going to be the amount of, of babies that a girl is going to have on average throughout her life. Um, we consider these years to be a woman's fecund years. Fecundity refers to their ability to have kids. I was just watching uh, PBS NewsHour with my study hall the other day, and there was this uh, congresswoman that just gave birth She's like in her 50s and just gave birth to some kid. I'm thinking, wow, good for her. I want to be a granddad at that age. Actually, I, more like 60. Okay, more like 60. Childbearing, uh, children per childbearing years per woman. Oh, well, you know, the area with the biggest youth population is also the place where you've got 
baby making spiraling out of control because of the lack of things like education, use of contraceptives, and things like this. So um, also a place where girls are going to be the least amount of education. Right, a place where girls have least amount of education. It's super sad. This is the reason why there's a lot of these um, uh, programs and initiatives to try to help educate and help women get more education and get out of their position of poverty. We looked at the, um, uh, the sustainable development goals. All right, the UN put forth these goals. A lot of them are centered on the education of, well, girls, trying to help them to live their lives, to um, get out of this circle of, of poverty and despair. Crude death rate per persons. Um, notice that the numbers here are not as high as the, as the birth rates, but you still have the most deaths in this region. Anybody know what country this is? It's a landlocked country. It's also the poorest country in, um, in this entire region, if not in all of Asia. Bangladesh. Close, Afghanistan. Well, Bangladesh is uh, over here. Um, this is Pakistan. They were both part of the partition of India. But Afghanistan is the, is the country right next to Pakistan. And, and super poor also has a very, very low life expectancy and a lot of deaths, which would make sense. Um, okay, so not too worried about that right there. We've already looked at that pretty closely. Population structure, we're starting to look at population pyramids now. <clears throat> I'm getting there. Population pyramid is going to be a visual display of the demographic situation of a country or of a region, or even of a city. You can use these things at all scales of analysis. What they normally would do is show uh, men and women, and then the age, as you can see here, uh, and then usually you might have either the ages written out here or over on the side, and it's gonna be like every five years would represent a different bar. Now, every five years, would represent a different bar on, on the graph. And, and then at the bottom, you either have a number that is in millions, as in millions of people, or it will be a bar that is in percentages. Now, you want to make sure that you understand what the population pyramids are showing you. Because if it's showing millions of people, it could appear fatter than a population pyramid that shows you by percentage. And, and, and so there is, um, if you use the populationpyramid.net website to look at population pyramids, the, the pyramids are all gonna be roughly the same width because you're using a percentage base. If you use the CIA World Factbook for your population pyramids, they're using a number of millions. So the higher the population, the fatter your population pyramid is going to look. Uh, all right. Now, also on a population uh, pyramid, you get to see this thing called dependency ratio. And, and really, the, the main one that I want you to know is the elderly dependency ratio. All right? Now, you, you've also got, um, when we talk about dependency, or usually we, we, we uh, maybe it's just me, but I default to elderly, but you also want to think about those who are too young to work. Um, and remember that the people there are the, are the ones who are working the hardest and the most for their, for their um, country. It's going to be individuals that you know, are kind of like in the prime of life. I'd say 25 all the way up to maybe their late 40s or mid 50s. And then people start to, to slowly but surely, people start to retire. And, and then once they're retiring, once they get old, like my, my, my grandparents were old, then they're not working and they need to be taken care of for health purposes and for other economic purposes. And so... My mom had three sons and, and, and a, a fourth stepchild once she remarried and also a very sick mom. So she had to focus mostly on raising us while at the same time focus on taking care of my old grandmother before she passed on. And so my mom actually came out of work and stopped working whenever I was like, maybe even in high school, I can't really remember. I think it was high school, she stopped working um, and, and would stay at home so she could uh, help with us and also help with um, right, we're taking care of my grandmother. After a little while, she started taking a few other jobs working in the city of Lexington before she retired for good. So that there's what we mean by dependency ratio. And you can usually use population pyramids to see this. Maybe we'll see an example in a second. Um, we just talked about sex structure. Okay, so um, here are some examples of 
uh, population pyramids. Notice at the bottom, like I said earlier, um, at the bottom you're seeing percentages, not numbers in millions. So the population pyramids are roughly the same width, except that over here in an LDC like Kenya, the majority of, of people in that country are kids under 15. Now see that? So you're going to see where 8% or more of the population is going to be just girls, just girls under five. Another 8% of the population is going to be just boys under five. So 16% of the population in Kenya at the time of this pyramid, which is apparently in 2014, is kids under five years old. That is a huge, huge, huge amount of mouths to feed and people to take care of. Notice though, people don't really live to be very old <clears throat> in Kenya because they don't have the uh, access to health that we do. If you start looking at countries like the United States, you have a lot of people, especially women, especially women that tend to live to be um, older than 80 years old. And, and, and increasingly, more and more people are living to be in their 90s or, or older than that. My grandmother lived to be in her 90s. Um, we got people living to be close to 100. All right. Uh, this right here is your main chunk of people who are taking care of these guys and these guys. This isn't such a bad uh, uh, um, switch. Really, most people, even up to the 70s, are capable of taking care of themselves in some shape or form. Uh, I know plenty of 70-year-olds uh, that are more than capable of taking care of themselves. Do y'all know that like Mitt Romney is 72 or 73 years old, something like that? I mean, we got people that the, the, the President Trump is... 72, I think. I mean, you know, 70 year olds, sometimes they're doing pretty good. I, I mean, I don't think Mitt Romney looks that old at all, but I mean, I was kind of shocked when I found out he was that old. Now, once you've been president, that's a totally different story. These guys come out of the presidency ready to die. You ever see the before and after pictures of people like George Bush and even President Obama? He comes in, he's so young and vibrant and, uh, you know, still, still just has that, that, that energy and that vibe that, you know, that we all know and love about Obama, but, um, Man, he got all old on me, you know? He got all old. Over here, you've got places like Italy, where the population is starting to decrease. Notice that you've got a, um, a, a thinner chunk of people who are having to take care of a wider chunk of old people and a s relatively smaller chunk of young. All right, enough on population pyramids. We're going to skip that. Oh, geez, I didn't know there were arrows. Okay. Um, Germany's age population as of 1996 would have shown areas that existed that were like dips in population due to the world wars and due to their, um, the, the booms and busts and things like that associated with population. I'll let you guys take a look at that, but just know that sometimes you can see weird outliers like this that represent human or physical disasters in different regions based on the population pyramid. Um, here is a picture of Iceland. And I want to say this is in 2000. This is how their population structure changes by 2025. So look at that. Um, it's, and we're in percentages. So it's, it's, you're going to have 100% of the population shown here. So the population here looks smaller in the pyramid than it does here, right? That's simply because the percentage is spread out over older people. Over older people. The percentages are spread out. Less kids, more older people, less people in their, I don't know, uh, middle, you know, productive ages or whatever it might be, based on percent, not based on number, because you're looking at percentages with this particular population pyramid. Finally, by 2050, we predict they're going to have a whole lot of old men and women, men and women, mainly women. Women tend to have longer life expectancies for possibly a lot of reasons. I don't think anyone really has a scientific reason for that, um, but... Uh, there you go. So Iceland's population structure is going to change over the course of time. Uh, a couple of old dudes hanging out on the bench. Great. That's going to be me and my brothers one day. We're going to be old dudes hanging out on the bench. Uh, I got this one dude that um, I, play, I play cello in my church orchestra. And my, my boy Stan is always talking about how hard of a day he had. We're like, Stan, what did you do, man? He says, I've been fishing all day. It's tough. Anyway, maybe one day I'll be able to retire and be cool like that. Um, here's Italy. Same scenario. To Italy in 2000, the population is already starting to level out or even go down. Less babies are being made or being born. And um, more and more of these people are going to live to be older. 
All right? And here is what that chain looks like. Bam. You've got a really high, a really high dependency, or I guess we could say elderly, dependency ratio right there. A very high elderly dependency ratio. And by 2050, if they don't figure out something, they're going to be screwed. All right? And Japan, Japan is in this exact same scenario here. You know, pretty much the exact same scenario as, as with Italy. Uh, Townsend, Tennessee, you can, you can um, also use population pyramids on a local level. How is this population pyramid different from Italy's? Well, I think we've got a graphic in here. This is the area where um, I want to say it is a place where it uh, has, has, a, um, well, has it's a quiet little area. Uh, peaceful side of the Smokies. I want to say there's also some retirement regions here. It's going to have a direct impact on the way the population looks on a local scale. Um, and here's the, another example, I guess. We're looking at other examples of local scale population pyramids. Don't want to spend too much time looking at the specifics of these pyramids because uh, I want y'all to get the gist of it. And I still have to talk about the demographic transition. Uh, Alaska. Um, this is the Aleutians East Borough of Alaska almost entirely men. And the reason for that is because it's uh, the, the, the fishing industry, all right? And you guys hear about the, the deadliest catch? The deadliest catch, this is the area where you don't have a bunch of women doing this kind of work. All right? It's mostly a man area, a man form of work. Um, you guys have access to this PowerPoint in Schoology. So you, you're able to see uh, or, or test your mic on these PowerPoints however you want to, but they show different things. One of the things I want to point out here is that um, this one here might be a college town. All right, for example, no, not college town. Um, geez, something like what we just now looked at. Uh, your college town regions might be something like this right here that shows a lot of young men and women kind of in the same general area. You have some of these might represent um, military bases or whatever it might be based on the population structure, a retirement community. All right, so I'll let y'all look at that more. There's the answers to them right there if you wanted to do that. Um, some, some places have more men than women. Others have more women than men. A couple of quick points I want to make here is that the, the number here of women versus men isn't super substantial. All right, it's mostly balanced. In China and India, y'all remember we read a couple of, or watched a couple of videos, read a couple of articles about how there was more men than women, mainly because of policies that were centered on um, maybe having fewer kids, and they would end up having abortions of females at the expense of having the preferred males. Uh, all throughout Chinese history, they've been very patriarchal. They preferred to have males, sorry ladies. Uh, and, and, and the result is now a lot of people, in particular in India and, and, and China, they're having a hard time uh, getting married, having kids of their own. So you might have whole generations of families with like a, a ton of, of elderly, a ton of people in their middle age area, and then like one grandchild. It's, it's kind of sad. I mean, I don't know. I couldn't imagine. I love, love my kids running around. It's fun. Uh, all right. So the demographic transition model, we're, at, we're getting there on population. I'm not sure how much of migration we're going to be able to look at in an hour. Um, somebody give me a time check. How am I going? Okay, great. So... <laughs> Um, the, the demographic transition model is, is one of the important models of AP and geography. We spent a lot of time looking at it. The, uh, it shows birth rates and death rates and compares them with development and progress and economic progress in a country and, and uh, helps us understand stages in which a population is going to grow and, and the population is going to start to level out with a higher uh, population density. So I, I'm going to use. Here's my, um, I made these for a video that I put up. Just a quick summary. I went ahead and put them in this PowerPoint. So these are here on my own. But the stage one of the population of the demographic transition model is, is going to be this region right here. And what you see is not a whole lot of growth. So population growth is pretty level. This one here is going to be on that earlier slide that we saw. The majority of human history is stage one. Population just isn't growing that much for the majority of human history, all right? And I think I listed this up here somewhere. Things like war and drought, 
um, and, and lack of food supply could wipe out a whole entire area or civilization. Disease, living in close proximity to animals, could cause high child mortality rates, preventing high population growth, and fertility rates were super high. Meaning, women or people had, we had tons of kids. We expected most of those kids were gonna die, so if the average number is somewhere around seven or eight kids, Somewhere around two to, th or to three of those kids, maybe even less than that, somewhere around two of those kids would actually live, the majority of them would die. Um, stage two uh, begins with the Industrial Revolution. Because of better medical advances, more food, things we talked about a little bit earlier, you start to see natural increase go up, which means the population is going up as well. This line here represents population growth, not natural increase. Natural increase is represented by the colored region. So the, the, the wider, the difference between, like I said, the birth rate and the death rate is the natural increase. And uh, death rates start to drop dramatically. There was never a point in human history where more babies were being made, and that's what caused population to go up. The fact of the matter is more babies were living to be adults, and that's what causes population to go up. Most important thing about the demographic transition model right there. Stage three is, uh, is, is um, demographic momentum is what causes the population to continue to rise because in this stage, the birth rate starts to go down like the death rate did. Natural increase is still high, so you still have a lot of, a lot of added population, but this is what we call demographic momentum. All right, demographic momentum. I know it's completely legible. Now I'm cool with that. So uh, finally, in stage four, natural increase is very, very low to non-existent, which means that your birth, your population starts to, if it goes up, it goes up only slightly, and it mostly begins to stabilize. Before stage five, you start to see where the population begins to even go down a little bit as the birth rates and death rates cross over to show a, a negative natural increase. Now, stage four and stage five is countries like most of your MDCs in the world. And the reason why they are the way they are is because high standards of living, urban populations are not ways that you, well, you don't want to bring kids into that. You want to live in a really highly urban area um, and, and have tons of kids. Uh, you also don't want to have, um, you know, kids cost a lot of money, y'all. I'm totally poor because I got a couple of kids and they need school and they need dance and they need food and they need diapers still for one of them and, and all these different needs. And when they get older, their needs don't go down. Their needs go up. I was just hearing someone, I was at the advisory council meeting yesterday. They were talking about in some places, cheerleaders are required to pay a $1,500 fee to cheer for the football team. Holy crap. I can't afford that. Kids are incredibly expensive. Now, in this, in this area, that's not what the fees are. They're way less than that. But nevertheless, kid, man, they're expensive. So, so this is the reason why in some stage four and stage five countries, uh, people are choosing not to have kids. Rather, they're, pursuing to, they're, they're, they're choosing to pursue careers. They want to be a doctor. It takes them to their 30 years to do that, and now they don't want to have kids. Or they get married when they're 30 years old. They want to be married for five or six years before they have kids. And now they're 36, 37, they just decide, hey, kids aren't for me. My twin brothers are probably never going to have kids. And part of me is sad about that. The other part of me is like, it's probably good for that kid to not be born. Right? Um, <laughs> take a public kid on my brother there. So uh, declining birth rates, uh, uh, which is associated with the demographic transition model, is... Um, the, number, the, the reason I left this on here is because the two most important things you can do is empower women, mainly, through education and healthcare reform. This being the most important. This not being as important as education. Education is the most important thing. And even still not as important as education is the um, uh, availability of contraception. If you want immediate results, get people to use contraceptives. If you want them to actually use contraceptives, you have to educate them in how to do so because you got traditions and cultures that are very much against the use of those things. Rather than 15 year old going to school, they want 15 year old to be in an arranged marriage and start having kids. Totally messed up. Um, all right, so 
percentage of women using family planning. Oh yeah, everyone in the developing world and practically no one in the place where the population is growing the most, once again, because they just don't know better or don't have access to contraceptions or birth control or any kind. Um, this, I believe, is the global population. Yeah, so global total population. Here is 1950, a lot of population growth. In, um, in 2010, Increasingly less children being born, still a lot of demographic momentum. In 2010, the world as a whole is going to be an example of a stage three country. And then by 2050, no, oh, that's actually not, um, I don't know if I like that. Uh, the population is still going up, but less and less kids are being born. The world, world population is probably not going to stabilize until around the turn of the century. By 2050, we're going to have about nine. Uh, 0.3 or 9.4, 9.5 billion people in the world. Uh, right now it's about seven and a half. So we got another two billion people, mostly kids that are growing up. I don't know about these population pyramids. Uh, they look a little bit not accurate to me, but, but just know the population is not slated to stabilize until um, uh, about 2100. Um, population um, will stabilize. Uh, it'll probably stabilize somewhere around um, 10 or 11 billion people. Uh, probably somewhere around 10 billion people. All right, so uh, I want to talk about this guy, Thomas Malthus. Now, I guess maybe this is where we end. If you guys want, um, we, we can talk more about migration maybe a little bit later. There's not a whole lot on the migration, but I know I'm running out of time. But Malthus is super important, and we definitely can't have a unit to review without talking about the guy. Um, he writes a, a, um, a uh, essay on the principle of population in 1798 um, at the time of the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. And what he was noticing is that the populations that were increasing the fastest and the most rapidly were also the ones that were the poorest, kind of like today if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa. He was looking at industrialized uh, Great Britain. And, and um, he was noticing that the, the, the these are the people that are, that are, that are expanding the, the fastest, the growth that's going on, not in the most uh, educated individuals. Uh, he was against contraceptives. He was a minister. So we're going to say against contraceptives. And so therefore, he felt like the best way to not have so many kids is abstinence, which is just, you know, don't, don't do it. Abstinence. <laughs> don't do it! Is his 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 policy? Okay. He claimed the population was growing faster than the um, increase in food supply. This is the, the uh, important part of his claim is that we were going to be in a weird situation where we have a lot of people and not enough food to go around. The analogy I like to give is let's pretend for a second that I used to live with um, just my uh, my mom and my two and my two brothers, and then all of a sudden my mom gets remarried and I have um, a stepbrother and. Um, a stepfather and all that, and my refrigerator is the same size, but the amount of food that's inside it is going to start going down as we get older and eat more food and as we add more food to the family. So um, that's what Malthus is saying is happening to the global food production. And to go back a slide, this is what that looks like. This is the linear growth of the, of the world's food. It's the only resource he's concerned with. And then the population is going to go crazy right here is where you get to a point where now there's not enough food and people are going to starve, there's going to be wars over competition for food, and um, disease and things like this are going to keep the, the population in check. We'll keep the population in check. We call these checks um, positive, positive checks. Things like um, disease. Things like war, all right, and things like, um, uh, uh, what was the other one I just now said, um, uh, competition, things like that, starvation, all right. So, so those are his positive checks, all right. Um, really quickly, just to talk about the last, last slide I'm going to cover with you guys, and we'll go. The theory and reality. There is also some, um, some, um, some criticisms to Malthus. Uh, you got neo-Malthusians like Paul Ehrlich, who wrote a book called Population Bomb in the 60s where he says we're going to have hundreds of millions of people uh, fall victim to Malthus's prediction 
but then yet we have green revolution that occurred and, and stopped that from happening. So people like Esther Bostrup, who predicted that we were going to continue to innovate, have so far been correct in that we have been able to produce more enough food to outstrip and outpace, I guess, the, uh, the, the speed in which the Malthusian theory is going to occur, all right, and, and make it completely false, more or less. But it's also important to know that in some of the poorest regions of the world today, you can already see, kind of, where Malthus' prediction are kind of happening. People are starving in some of the poorest countries on Earth, located within sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they are continually fighting over resources and things like this. And, and, so, and so there's both sides of the coin. Um, who knows? Hopefully we'll be able to hurry up and colonize the moon and then uh, make uh, uh, food out of air that we breathe and, and, and everything will be okay and we'll figure it out. And, and climate change will be at least for our concerns. So there's my review. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you all for staying.